Here we go. All right. All right. Hello, inventors and entrepreneurs. My name is Andrew Kraus. I'm one of the co-founders here at Inventor Groups of America. Wave your hands in front of the screen if you're new here to Inventor Groups of America or type into the chat, I'm new and we can all welcome you. If you don't know where the chat is, just down below, click on the little chat button and then on the right hand side, I believe it will show the chat. So type in if you're new. Also type in if you're uh, where you're from, like me, what state, what country, you got people from around the world. So just a brief intro, uh, IGA was co-founded by Stephen Key and myself. Stephen, raise your hand there, wave your hand there. Um, to teach individuals how to best commercialize their product ideas, as well as strengthen and support inventor groups throughout the nation. And we do a lot of free education. And this is one of those great pieces of free education where you have a fantastic speaker on that's going to uh, bring you up to speed on what he knows. So we have a directory of local and regional inventor groups on our website. If you're located near one, uh, we highly encourage you to join. So make sure to jump on our website and check that out. We'd love to hear your name and what state and country you're from. So go on over to the chat, like I said, and type in what state and country you're from. Please do not disclose anything that is confidential and is not already publicly available. That's kind of stating the obvious. Um, so this meeting is going to be recorded. We'll be harnessed on our website and our YouTube channel soon as soon as well. But make sure to stick around. There's nothing like attending one live where you can actually ask the speaker some questions. Um, if you have any questions for the speaker, type them into the chat as they come to you. All right, so here we go. Keith Mullen is our speaker today. Keith Mullen knows what is required to become a successful inventor. During his 30 years, he's been developing, he's not 30 years old, but during, his, during 30 years, he's been developing his new products. He's signed 23 licensing agreements, very impressive for his properties. In total, he estimates his creativity has resulted in 18 product lines and 107 individual products, um, including numerous items for the pet industry. He's filed 30 patent applications and has 19 patents issued in his name as a co-inventor. His products have been sold in leading retailers around the world, including Walmart, Costco, PetSmart, Petco, Target, and Best Buy. Where did he achieve these remarkable, remarkable creative feats? From his garage and his home office, working together with product development teams, engineers, and clients. Keith Mullen is also a serial entrepreneur who's founded five companies, received major national press. He remembers building his first prototype at age 11 called Snow Grips. So I'd like to hear more about that using his high school workshop because he wanted to be able to walk uphill on skis. Well, that's kind of cool. He received his first letter of intent for a licensing agreement in his college dorm room. During his successful career in real estate development, Mullen developed um, and licensed his inventions as a side hustle. During his corporate lunch breaks, he would FedEx sell sheets. I was back before we had email all the time, I'm assuming. Keith can let us know more about that and prototype samples to potential licensees. When he discovered that real estate development was not his calling, um, at the same time the recession of 2007 hit, he decided to vote, devote himself fully to product development and entrepreneurship. We're glad he did. During this meeting, IGA co-founder Stephen Key and myself right here will interview Keith to learn his tips, tricks, and advice for becoming successful as a creative person. What's his creative process? How does he approach prototyping? What, what does he do about intellectual property and patents? What are his favorite tools to pitch his ideas? How does he negotiate and win licensing deals? So this is, if it's your goal to license your ideas on new products repeatedly, you really don't want to miss this one, guys. And you're right here, so you're definitely not going to miss it. Stephen, um, you've known Keith for a while as well as well as I have since he was an event rights student at one point. What do you have to say about Keith? Well, first of all, that's a very Im impressive um, resume. Keith, make sure you raise your hand so everybody can see you. Hi, um, everybody. Thanks for having me on, everybody. I've got a little bit of a cough today, so I've got uh, got somebody else's invention called Cough Drops, and I'll uh, I'll kind of work through it. But uh, thanks for having me on, and and looking forward to fielding questions and uh, kind of help everybody uh, kind of pursue their their projects and the and their properties. Well, Keith, we want to thank you for spending some time with us because um, I've known you for a long time, and yeah, you've been successful for many many years. So let's start at the very beginning. All right. 
what is the background? Are you an engineer? What did you study in college for you to kind of go in this world of inventing? Yeah, uh, so um, I had a, I've always wanted and loved to just have three-dimensional thought. And um, I love taking three-dimensional thought and turning that into three-dimensional objects, you know, whether that be, you know, from beginning of go-karts or, you know, snow grips or, you know, Legos. I mean, obviously way back then, I mean, you know, Tinker does anything. I, I just love building things. You know, I was like uh, doing that. And I thought my calling was um, architecture. So I went to uh, University of Colorado Boulder, their School of Environmental Design, majored in architecture um, and uh, went through that process and then discovered that, you know, architects, you really had to be, you know, to really command architecture and to do it well at the scale I was thinking. You had to be like, well, back in those days, you know, Michael Graves or one of the New York Five. And, you know, you would spend, you know, an entire career working from a big corporate architectural firm from the center of the building to a window seat. And then maybe, maybe then you'll be able to design something. You know, like, I didn't really want to, you know, go through that grind of, um, you know, the, arch the architectural career and to figure it, okay, the people who are figuring out the design and actually making things go are the people writing the checks. And that would be the real estate developers and the project managers. So I kind of went that direction and then started in uh, construction management right out of college. Uh, working for a very large construction management firm, uh, Huey International. Um, they're owned by Balfour Beatty, which uh, built the English Tunnel. So they, that's kind of the, really the project management and architecture was going to blend together in that firm and uh, did some really fun projects for them. Really great, great, amazing opportunity kind of um, that I was kind of thrust into right out of, right out of college. And it's kind of, uh, you know, cut my teeth on how to get uh, you know, really big, large projects done. Then kind of went through that, like I said, you know, construction management, real estate, uh, then eventually went into work for um, real estate development and uh, became a development director of Floyd Homes here in San Diego, running their portfolio. And in 2007, it was, just got to a point where my original start of designing products and environments and things and where I ended up was I was mostly dealing with lawyers, contractors, bankers, and, and reading contracts and, and on you know, Excel spreadsheets all day, because at that level, you're just, it's bottom line. It's our ROI was 12.5%. That was my responsibility. And the create, I would hire architects at that point, and that would be really only like 15% of my day. The rest was trying to assemble, you know, a larger real estate project. Um, and I just kind of lost, uh, just kind of like, I need to go back to what I really love to do you know, rather than okay. where I ended up. I thought that it was going to be a different um, existence, I guess. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to okay. reinvent myself and pivot and then go back to, you know, uh, I don't know, product development. And during that 15-year real estate development uh, time, I was, like I said, my side gig was, uh, you know, product development and, you know, doing things at, at lunch breaks and weekends. And I take my... Uh, vacations from corporate instead of going to like Hawaii or whatever, um, I would go to Javits and go to the toy show. You know, I'd, I'd go and do conventions and I have so much fun. You know, those were kind of, those were vacations for me, going out into the Javits and the toy show, things like this. It's so much fun. Well, I'm really glad you said that because a lot of people think you have to be trained to do this. So you had kind of a different path. All right, I want to jump in real quickly because there's a lot of questions I have for you and I know everybody does too. Yeah. Looking at the, the volume, the body of work that you've done, you've come up with a lot of ideas, right? So right. can you talk a little bit about that creative process? What do you do? How do you start? Do you do it in your room? Do you do it surfing? I know you surf, you live down mm -hmm. in Southern California. Where do you do it? And how do you come up with all those ideas? Um, well, it kind of, ironically, it's very similar to how I was trained as real estate development, where you're managing many different scopes of work simultaneously in a, you know, various uh, parallel tracks, multitasking. So uh, I took a system combined with your system, or, or quite frankly, more or less quite similar. You start at the beginning and you come out at the end of a step of, you know, you come up with the idea, you put in the inventor's notebook. I mean, you and I could both kind of dictate the 10 steps but you kind of dissect those steps and then um, you kind of chart them out. And then you basically, um, for each project or idea that you have, you're running 
those individually on your little on your little schedule. You know, and you do that for each project. But but wait a minute, I want to get before that. I know you're great yeah. at management. I know you are. <laughs> but where does that spark of inspiration happen? Does it happen in the shower, in the car, at the beach? I mean, how do you start that process? Yeah, so um, you have to listen a lot. You have to, um, in my case, you have to be in a mental space um, to receive, shall we say, energy and or you know, vibrations from the ether that's around you. And it's kind of sort of Zen and yoga type of thing, but that is just quite frankly what it is. I mean, you can't, you just kind of absorb things that they happen. I mean, that's why I love going to conventions. You can literally feel the energy in the air of everybody doing things. And you can kind of grasp those things and turn those into something. And it's kind of amorphous of how I'm trying to explain it. But I think just clearing your mind and running your life where you're able to do that so it's, let's just say you're going through a tumultuous, you know, younger days, you know, you know, early twenties, whatever, going through a tumultuous relationship breakup or something like that. I have zero ideas. And so, you know, you have to have um, some self-management of how you run your life, I think, to okay. kind of clear all of the things that are, that generate noise that don't, that would inhibit your ability to kind of accept uh, things that are coming towards you. So um, but, you know, specifically, I would say I could break them down into maybe three or four different areas that I kind of focus on. Um, and one of those is uh, really right before you go to sleep, when you're you know, in bed, you're kind of sort of tired and all that stuff is kind of in your head, just kind of wishing away. I used to have a small little whiteboard, uh, you know, right by my uh, bed. It was actually on the wall. And if I could just have enough energy, I'd come up with an idea just as you're kind of in the, almost that dream slate, uh, dream uh, state just to get up and just go, you know, ball with something, you know, ball with ring, whatever. So you can think of that concept in the morning. Um, so that's uh, one way I would do it. And you can do that when you wake up as well. Um, so being aware of those quiet times um, and being aware of how you're thinking. The other is, uh, you know, collaboration um, or interaction with clients where you'll, you'll meet somebody or you'll be in a meeting and you just have the energy of people throwing and exchanging ideas um, okay. where they're saying, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we had a levitating peanut butter spoon or something like that? Or if we had you know, some type of off the wall sort of thing, but then you take those concepts that they are throwing back around the room and you then try to compress that into something that actually makes sense. Um, then the third is really, like I kind of mentioned, going to um, conventions and networking and just walking the halls and just absorbing all the energy in those type of environments. Um, and um, I think mean, the fourth is, um, you know, just watching, just going into places. I mean, I go, I go to dog parks and just watch and just mm. see what people are doing or, you know, go right. to, not that they have anymore, but Toys R Us, you know, that's a great place because not Toys R Us, used, people used to go there so their kids could quite frankly play. I mean, they would buy stuff. They would just go there and, let the kids play everything on the boxes and play. And you can watch and see what kids would do, you know, with, uh, with their playtime. So, you know, just observations, uh, you know, observing things and observing what people are doing. So those are kind of the four macro ways that I try to uh, um, come up with new concepts um, that I can kind of, you know, think about right now. But yeah, I hope that, I hope that helps. Yeah. Oh, it does help. Tell us this. Um, is it important to stay in one industry or do you jump all around? I, yes and no, right? So it's no doubt, you know, being deep in the industry and having the, the connections and the, the networking and the, and the people to talk with at a very, very deep level who really kind of understand and directing things six months before the news picks up on or a new direction of the industry um, that you can kind of tell is like, oh my gosh, uh, you know, AI is going to be huge in five years or, you know, um, grooming, let's say in pets is going to be huge in five years. And you say, okay, grooming is something I should really focus on. So you'll pick up those little tidbits, um, you know, in you know, the industry that you're in. That being said, you know, some of the most amazing innovations, um, I think uh, some of the prizes, you know, prize innovation awards, will get somebody that, that has no experience whatsoever that comes into the industry and they think of something so different and so, um, I don't say disruptive, but just so different because he's not in the industry. 
okay. um, that they've come in and said, hey, have you thought about it this way? And that really helps as well, because you are thinking, you're thinking the way that um, nobody else in the industry is thinking, and maybe you can apply your, your background, your experience, or your skill sets to a solution that no one's thought of yet. So, okay. um, yeah. How many, how many ideas do you pitch a year? Oh, more than 50, less than 300. Yeah. So quite a few. Yeah. Yeah, quite, quite a few. So when you, let's say you're in the pet industry, because we're really going to dive into that particular industry. I know you've been in others. So you come up with this great pet idea. You went to the dog park. You saw something. You were inspired. You, you're like, hey, I got this great idea. And you start to reach out to those companies in the pet space. Who do you pitch to first and why? And how many companies do you pitch that idea to within the pet industry? Yeah, well, to even get to the pitch, um, you know, I will definitely do a lot of research on the concept first, typically, to really understand um, the niche or the benefits that that product served before I pitch, because I really have to know those. I mean, part of the, um, at least the value add that I hope that I bring to my clients is that I tell them something new that they don't know. And so if I present something that is, you can just Google and say, like, oh, okay, there's five of them, you know, about Amazon, you know, what if, you know, I, I look, that doesn't come across that great <laughs> if you haven't done your homework. Um, so let's just assume you go through all your upfront you know, activities of getting to a point of pitching. <laughs> um, at this point, um, I, I usually try to be fairly selective as far as the clients I pitch to, uh, just because um, I you know, have worked with them before. I like working with them. They like working with me. The relationship is pretty easy. Um, you know, contracts have already, you know, we have one or two or three that are already um, used, so there really is a lot of negotiation. We already know what, what it is. Um, and just also their distribution channels and, you know, how many stores they're in or what's their brand awareness, either on a national or, you know, international level. Um, it's, uh, um, you know, they have to be, you know, pushing or have a commitment to the product line that can push it to the levels that, you have a decent ROI on the project, right? So um, some projects, you know, it'll be four to five years from inception to market delivery. So that's a lot of investment and work on, on my end to get it to that point. So um, working with a company that may not have a larger distribution um, or, you know, just shall I say is, you know, not well financed to somebody else, your the volume sales aren't just going to be as big as you need them to be to be, you know, commensurate to, you know, what your investment is. So even Keith, um, Keith is using a word that we don't normally hear inventors use. They usually say company, or if they're a little more sophisticated, they'll say potential licensee. The inventor's a license or licensee. Keith, that I know you've mentioned this before, Stephen, uses the term client. So um, Keith, can you tell us why you use the word client? I think that says a lot about your mindset. Yeah, so um it's really a partnership relationship with your, you know, licensee or uh, the person you're working with. I mean, it's got to be um, both parties are helping each other collaboratively to grow. And in the a, um, you know, if you invent what I would call a platform technology, that's something that can be applicable to many different products. That's something where you're not only coming up with your first product that you, you can use that platform technology or the patents um, to various different iterations or embodiments or modifications to your product. And most times, well, pretty much every time you sign a license agreement, you don't really know what's going to happen. It just kind of takes on its own life. And then all of a sudden, somebody will present it to Target or Costco, and the Costco buyer will say, hey, could you put that in a shower? You know, or something, or something bizarre. Like, nobody thought about that. Uh, I don't know, we go figure it out. Um, you know, sure, we'll figure it out for the bathroom environment if Costco wants it. So uh, when those things come up and, the, and your original concept grows to a point of it's just got legs on its own, it starts to grow, you have to have, you just build relationships with your client and they have to trust you, you have to trust them to um, 
yeah, to manage that process, um, you know, ethically and and quite frankly, in a fun way. At the end of the day, it's got to be fun for me. <laughs> if I'm having fun, I'm gonna go surf as Andrew goes or whatever. So um, I don't know that. So referring to them, you know, just in conversations as, hey, you're my licensee, or you know, that type of thing. It just um, it's just more of a, a applicable term to the actual relationship that you're gonna be having with your licensee as you kind of go forward. Because ideally you want to do a license with them. And then when they have an idea or they have a problem at step, you want them to call you first. They will say, hey, we're thinking about this idea. Hey, Keith, do you think you could figure this out or you know anybody or you know, can you work out with this? And um, let's go ahead. And in that case, you know, I'm a vendor of theirs at the end of the thing. I hope they, you know, um, they could be in that as well. Like they're, they're um, you know, value consultant or contractor. That's how I like to be, um, not a licensee per se. Because I, um, yeah. yeah. I think what, I think what's really interesting, we've heard this before, once you build that relationship, <clears throat> that relationship that you're talking about, mm -hmm. when you're first starting out, you're reaching out to a lot of companies. But when you start to build relationships and they start to know who you are and you start to have that back and forth, they become a client. So I guess the question is, how many clients do you actually work with during the year in the pet industry? Is it 50? Is Ooh, it five? Uh, yeah, so I would say active clients where I'm, you know, working on projects with, where I'm, you know, perfect. You, you have, Steven, you, have, you know how many hours I put in. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I would say at the moment, let's just say eight clients that I'm you know, always working on per se. But, you know, these are projects that are, you know, there, there's the work and then kind of up and down, up and down. So there's these constant kind of um, um, work components that are very intense. So the, the challenge is, is um, you know, because I still need to, service clients to make sure that they're happy and, and um, get the product to market. Once the product is done through its first article, the work scope or the, the things that I'm doing responsible for kind of you know, start to taper off. And so if you know, my max capacity is, yeah, probably right now at, at about yeah, seven to eight clients, I, I just don't have any more time in the day. And so, um, yeah, but you know, pitching, you know, Pitching to, gee, I want to do the project and I want to go ahead and start a project with you. Sometimes that, you know, can take, you know, you know, sometimes 16 months. You know, I'll, I'll pitch, I'll even, you know, each convention, maybe I'll show them, you know, different ideas for, you know, three different conventions. So I'll be maybe pitching them my concepts for, you know, three years. And then the third year, like, yeah, like, I, I finally get this. Let's go ahead and proceed with it. So I'm still pitching all the time. Well, we can back up. At the moment, I'm not because I'm a little overwhelmed, but uh, it, normally I would be pitching. Let me go back up. If I'm under, let's say, five clients, then yeah, I would be pitching a lot more just because I'd have a, a lot more time to do so and quite frankly, capacity to take on more projects. So it's really that, that balance of kind of getting up to, okay, what's the capacity that I can still... Um, yeah. still do what I need to do and, and not... Uh, you know, still have time to even you know, it, it sounds like his wide. definition of a client is a company he's currently um, working on closing a licensing deal with maybe the earlier stages or he's already closed a licensing deal with he's continuing to help him help them. Is that your definition of a client or like uh, well, so in recent um, years, I've also taken on um, sourcing. So it's not just here's the prototype and here's the, you know, here's the IP package, the asset package that I'm licensing. In some cases, you know, they'll say, hey, we don't know how to manufacture that, or we don't, we've never done this type of manufacturing before. What do we do? Um, so in that case, then I would quite frankly put together their supply chain for them. And so that is, uh, shall we say, a, a, an added value I'll bring to the table, but it's just, I'll do what has to be done to get the product into the marketplace. Okay. So whatever that may be, um, if that is uh, you know, doing you know, packaging design, that's you know, finding vendors, if that's doing formulations, uh, you know, testing inspection, 
um, whatever whatever I think there is sorry, a hole uh, in the project, um, I'll go ahead and, and just go do. Uh, and they will say, hey, yeah, you go go figure out the packaging for us or go and we need a vendor to do testing inspection. Do you know, do you know anybody? Can you figure that out? So it's, it's helping them and everybody is um, so busy these days. If you can bring an additional horsepower to the table, that gets them that much more um, excited to work with you and you're solving problems for them. It's not like you go to them and say, hey, here's my you know, gadget that I, you know, what do you think here do you wanna buy? It's like, well, yeah, here's what I'm bringing to you and I've got the ability for you to execute. I mean, everybody has a, you know, a concept, a, you know, a business plan or, you know, you know, intentions of, of a project, but if you can't execute and you can't execute well uh, on time and on budget, then, you know, that, then it doesn't obviously go. So um, that's where it truly is kind of, you know, client relationship where I'm bringing more to the table than just an asset package to license. Got it. Hey, yeah. um, could you tell us a little bit about when do you pitch? How do you pitch? You reach out to them and say, hey, I've got this great idea. Or do you wait to a certain time of the year? How do you go about it when you've got this great idea and you think it's perfect for one of your clients? Yeah, so I mean, uh, we kind of answer those one at a time. So definitely timing. So the, uh, the buying season of retailers, people that need to, I'm sure, know this, but you know, the season for buying, <clears throat> I guess we're going to go backwards. Stocking and retail is you've got your holiday season. You've got your spring season, then your you know summer season, and it just kind of goes in clockwork in every year. So if you <coughs> if buyers have just finished their um, shipping of their spring season, they've closed out their Christmas season, then they're ready now to think about the next season. So buy so let's just say buyers are thinking about you know spring season for twenty five. Um, therefore, they'd be looking at ideas in 24 in the early part of the year. So um, I like to think like right after Super Bowl is a good time to start pitching. Um, you know, everyone's done with, you know, holidays and New Year's and everyone's, you know, hangover's done or whatever. You know, you're through Super Bowl and everybody's like, okay, I just, you know, blew a bunch of money, did a whole bunch of stuff and, you know, blah, 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 I didn't do what I was supposed to do. And now I'm ready to get to work and get going. So that normally just kind of happens right after Super Bowl, you know, Birds of the Beast type of thing and start building nests, however you want to call it. Um, and uh, that is, is a good time to pitch. Um, and then after, um, you know, right after summer, because they've got the quarters are coming to close, fourth quarter's coming up, it's still going to hit their numbers. You know, they may want to put in one more project right before the year closes out. They may have a budget in a, in a great situation that they haven't spent through yet. They're like, okay, yeah, we can... You know, use this money for R and D and move the project forward. So those are kind of the two segments, uh, and ironically, those are kind of mostly the two segments of when uh, conventions are. Steve, you kind of know this. That's where there's a big push of conventions at the beginning of the year, and then it kind of blows off a little bit, and then there's another push. You know, pretty much end of summer into the fall. There's another bunch of conventions at that time. So you do you so you pitch at conventions? Set up yeah. So uh, so there, there's a timing issue. Then how I pitch is, um, yes, for, for current clients, um, if I have an idea that's appropriate for them, I'll, I'll give them a, you know, set up, set up a meeting, uh, mostly do it by Zoom or Teams, whatever the platform is, and do it uh, um, just like this video conferencing. And then in others, uh, yeah, I'll go out to the conventions and uh, pitch to them, you know, set a meeting. You know, you have to, in the best case scenario, you can contact them before the convention, set up a meeting time. Uh, confirm within the meeting, you know, they're very busy. So maybe you have, you know, 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes of time. Uh, so you need to kind of slot that in with them. Um, you know, yes, you can go by interventions and start a conversation, but they're not going, more than likely not going to look at your concepts right there. And uh, you probably wouldn't want to do that anyway. Just you know, like, hey, how's it going? Hey, do you want to look at this? I mean, it doesn't really you need to build things a little bit and go email, like, you know, do the tennis back and forth on just building the relationship and then present later to them uh, or maybe the next year, you know, at the convention, do it that way. So, um, yeah, I do, it, it's a combination. So for um, clients that I have relationships with, I'll you know, call them on the phone and get a meeting done. And other, uh, in other situations, I'll, uh, you know, pitch at conventions and go through that. Keith, I want to show this. 
Uh, Stephen, I was gonna show some products when you're ready. Yeah, I wanna show this one product um, that you, you really are a material expert with this one bionic. Andrew, can you show this one particular product line? If it's on the, yeah. There you go. You see yeah, that? so this is called a bionic, uh-huh. And um, I was working with the engineering team. Uh, we started back in, I think the, the actual concept for bionic was back in 2006. Um, when I kind of came up with it, I wanted to be the, you know, the, the strongest and most durable uh, you know, shoe toy uh, ever. And so worked with a group of uh, engineers to kind of put together a material that took about four years to develop. Um, and uh, yeah, four years. <laughs> and then we had the material all done and figured out and we we're testing it. It was amazing testing. And then the uh, uh, about to launch it and uh, the tsunami in Japan took out one of the uh, formulation houses that made a component of, of bionic rubber. So we had to, uh, you know, so we couldn't get a part of it. And then uh, we had to restart uh, and figure out a new way to, you know, to make the, the bionic rubber and like, continue with it. But uh, yeah, bionic, um, yeah, it's a, it's a basically a, a thermoplastic elastomer, a TPE, and uh, basically just took that um, new TPE, you know, compound and uh, put it into different shapes. Uh, you know, it might test up to over 450 PSI. Uh, it's incredibly strong. Uh, it's, the molecule is kind of like a nest, if you will, where you've got interlinking, cross-linking molecular chains that is, they kind of flex and bend when you chew, but they don't, they don't crack and burst. So as it's flexing and kind of moving around, um, it just kind of bends out of the way of a tooth form. Um, and then uh, that's sort of how it works. And then it also have a, a patent um, on the line of what I call defensive geometry, where it kind of works like a, um, well, an M1 tank, right? So it's designed specifically to disperse incoming rounds and energy around um, kind of the tank shapes. And that's the way um, Bionic works as well. So it's kind of a combination of um, the rubber formula, how the shapes are put together and design. Uh, yeah, really a uh, really fun product. Mm -hmm. uh, this here is a new product of yours. Yes. Well, first of all, how long has Bi Bionic been selling? Because it's been around for a while, right? <laughs> yeah, since uh, 2010. Uh -huh. okay. All right, wonderful. Yeah. What about this new one here? This was just launched, didn't it? Yeah, it's called a uh, Jolly Dipper. And uh, basically, it's, um, we're messing around again, kind of looking here. It's a little mortar and pestle, and it uses the flex of the rubber to actually make it work. So kind of like nom, 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 nom. <laughs> so you've got this little bowl shape in here, and you can put uh, the fill and treat, uh, which is a peanut butter paste, and you fill the bowl uh, down inside there. And then as you flex it, and the dog flexes it, it'll splatter all on the inside. And so the dog will have a really hard time to get the peanut butter paste out of there. And so this is a redirected chewing toy or you know, an Occupy toy where the dog will be really busy trying to get all the peanut butter out of the inside of this ball. Um, so he doesn't uh, you know, have uh, destructive chewing behaviors and you know, separation anxiety and all those other type of things. So it's uh, a kind of a, yeah, uh, a really fun item. But this product has taken a long time to launch. Yeah, so the... Um, <laughs> It originally started off, this had many, 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 many iterations. Um, and it really came down to how to how to mold this, because um, it originally was a couple of different parts that made this sphere work, and it was really complicated. Then um, yeah, at one point, we uh, talked with the engineer and said, okay, let's make it out of one part. And so it was actually one, two. It was actually six parts at one point, you know. I mean, it was the original prototype. I have them over here. Uh, no, I guess I don't. Yeah, I'm looking at my prototype board over here. Um, yeah, so yeah, it was like six parts to begin with. And so the, the cost of goods to make this was just, you know, off kilter. But when it was understood of how to make this, I mean, you have to imagine how difficult that is on an injection mold to do all these undercuts. I mean, how do you make a bowl out of it? That's really hard. <laughs> but it's a very complicated bowl that does this. But your cycle time at the factory is very quick. And, uh, you know, you can crank out a lot of these in an eight-hour shift, and that gets your cost of goods, you know, quite low. And that's uh, really what kind of 
that was the final pin to drop to get this uh, with a license. You say, yeah, I, this makes sense. It, it now pencils out. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've got one question. Then I want to open it up, Andrew, because I could go on and on and on forever about this, but I want everybody to have a chance to ask questions. If there's one thing you are a master at, and I haven't seen this with a lot of inventors, but for some reason you have got this dialed down. You create not only a product, but sometimes you create a whole product line. Yeah, so I, I think I kind of I learned that. Um, there was, a, there was a, a toy agent I used to work with. I don't know if he's on here, but um, he was actually a master at this. And I kind of learned from him of, <laughs> excuse me, you really want to develop. Well, I watched him take a very simple idea and make it into a bunch of different ideas using the same platform technology. And you'd be surprised at what, what a platform technology could be. I mean, in your case, it was a guitar pick. Your platform technology was a guitar pick. Like, okay, yeah, but you can make a guitar pick out of a out of a devil's head, out of a Disney head, out of a, out of a robot, out of whatever. I mean, that's what your platform technology that's applicable to all different formats and iterations and modifications of the concept. So um, that's what I, in a best case scenario of inventing or um, licensing is you truly have a, um, you can think about things where like, oh yeah, I could, we could put this on a balloon and it'll, and it'll you know, fly away or something like that. You know, things that are, um, and you won't know those at the very beginning. You just, you just won't. And then somebody will say, hey, have you thought about, like I said, putting on a balloon or Putting in the shower, have you thought about doing this with that? Um, and then really kind of pressing, pushing the envelope of what that is. You know, I try to I try to say, okay, yeah, this is cool, it is what it is, and you know, it's just a little thing or a little gadget, or whatever, it's a paper clip. But hey, what else can we do with that? And and really, really kind of, you know, just kind of make that product funnel larger and larger and larger. Because the more products you have that you know, under bionic and you have all these different SKUs, um, that is where you start to turn your product into a brand. And as a brand, that is should be your goal, is that your brand that you're building ends up being an evergreen brand. And that's in the best case scenarios, um, you know, what you're trying to do. Steven, it sounds like what you're saying have. is a good percentage of the time the product is going to change. I think a lot of inventors, they, they've been thinking about something for a long time. Keith, it comes fixed in their mind as to what it is, and they have an inflexibility. And I think, Stephen, what he's saying is you got to be flexible and be willing to change. Is, is that what you're saying, Keith? Yeah. I mean, you'd be surprised, I mean, just how little something you have to dial it, just a couple of clicks to the left or the right for it to just you know, just explode. You know, it's it's almost the mindset of the back in real estate. It's called location, location, location. You know, you could have an ice cream store, but if that ice cream store is, you know, two blocks away from the beach and behind the laundry mat, you're going nowhere. But all you needed to do is bring it forward and one step close to the beach, which is quite frankly nothing. And all of a sudden, you know, it's just went out the door. So it, it's that same type of thing. There's just if it's just not working. And you're working too hard at it, and it's not going. The idea is still sound, no doubt. It's still sound, but you need to um, just tweak it a bit more or find another industry for it, even uh, maybe that you haven't thought about. Um, and that's, uh, yeah, I mean, kind of pressing that and, and just getting on the whiteboard and just thinking of all different ideas with that basic concept that you've already got. You can't, the problem is you, a lot of people just fall in love with their, with their, with their basic form and they're not flexible. They're like, oh, it has to be this way. It's gotta be that way. It's gotta be this way. And uh, it never works like that. I've never seen a project work like that. Yeah, I like that he said you pushing the boundaries. And by doing that, you're building a, a, a line. And by building a line, you're building a brand and that brand it can increase your revenue. You have a whole product line. I mean, it's one SKU is great, but can you imagine having 20? It's just, it's just kind of a, just kind of taking one thing and just going, all right, where else can we go with this? You guys, I'm going to open it up. Um, real real so quick, I'm just, on, just on that aspect, this way. let's say the Wright brothers said, okay, here's the airplane. 
and this is the way it's going to be. This is there's no other iterations to it. This is it. This is our product. No one's going to do anything to it. We'd all be flying around in in like lawn chairs right now. Okay, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's, that's great. Great. I love that. You have to think bigger than what your original invention is. <laughs> Stephen, that's amazing. I think it's incredible advice. Um, do you want me to do the first question, Stephen? Then you can do. We can yeah, please. Yeah, please, Andrew. Uh, Trishona says, uh, really enjoying the conversation. Question for Mr. Mullen. You're Mr. Mullen now, Keith. Very formal. Uh, uh, Keith. <laughs> what, what did your prototype look like? Did you ever pitch with a semi-finished prototype or were they always complete and working prototypes? Um, so, I mean, I started prototyping, you know, a long time ago where there wasn't 3D printing. I mean, I, I literally would have to walk through the, the aisles of Home Depot and just look for shapes that I'm looking for and cut them out of stuff. Um, I mean, Home Depot guys were just driving, they just thought I was nuts. And like, I'm looking for this and does that. I'm like, well, I didn't think damn it. So, I mean, some of my prototypes were more glue and tape than, than an actual product, <laughs> you know, to be sad, sad to say. Um, so the answer is, if you can demonstrate it working, however you do that, whether it's with rubber bands, tape, and cardboard, just to show the idea. I mean, I've done some in tinfoil. Like, you know, here it is, you know, I mean, I can paint them sometimes. Um, or clay, you know, modeling clay from Michaels. You know, that's great stuff. They've got some great modeling clay. Um, there's some uh, plastics uh, that you can heat up and form it into your own stuff. So you don't have to, you know, do CAD work and put all, you know, you can literally go to Michaels and build your own plastic prototypes um, really easily and way easier than it used to be. Um, yeah, I used to use Bondo and, and take Bondo and squish it and mold, you know, car Bondo into, into, uh, into toys and stuff. So, um, you know, now, yes, I, I try to do it as professionally as I can, but, you know, learning and learning the process, um, I would do some very, very um, rudimentary prototypes. And in some cases, I wouldn't even do prototypes. I would do digital drawings instead, mm. um, but they have to be really good. You know, but you can do that these days. Thank you, Keith. Stephen, you got one you picked from the chat? Well, there's 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 so many of these. Yeah, we can't but, answer them all, guys, but we're okay. Gonna let's talk about intellectual property. Important, not important. Uh, where are you with that? Um, you know, definitely important, but for not for the reasons that most people think that they are. Um, you know, people say, Oh, I have an idea and it's great. And everyone says, Okay, go run and get a patent and you know, that type of thing, and and you know, spending a lot of money and the patent may not be right, or you may get approved for something that's not your invention. Um, as you know, Steve, as you've taught, um, you can file your own patent. Uh, I think it's what one hundred and thirty-five dollars now to write it yourself. Um, there's many different tools you can use to write that. I mean, obviously, Chat GTP is pretty much <laughs> things get a lot easier. You know, write myself a patent for a new whatever, um, and file your 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 pending patent. You can do that on your own. You could uh, learn you know, IP and learn uh, patent writing. Uh, it's a great thing to do. Um, it's just part of the process. It's kind of like, well, you know, if you want to go roller skating, you got to learn how to roll wheels or something like that. I think you know, at least writing a patent is a good thing to do. Um, and you file it. So when you the licensing stage and having a pending patent, we in those discussions, it's always just a check the box thing because um, their lawyers are going to have to look at it and lawyers will say, you know, the person goes, well, it's a patented rare. You know, like, of course it is, you know, type of thing. It's more of a check the box and, you know, having something to return when the question comes. But in reality, having the product coming to market and having the IP exactly equaling the product is really hard to do, you know, with one patent. So, um, you know, for one product, you may have, well, in some cases, three or four patents. And you know, Steve, you know this. I mean, you have many, many multi-layered patents. It's called a patent ticket. Those end up being you know, very expensive and take a lot of time. But there's no sense in investing in that level of IP protection unless the product sales can demonstrate that that investment is warranted. Um, so um, I hope that answers the question. I, I, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I have a lot of patents. Yeah, they're, it's nice, it's impressive. Is that the value of what I do? I don't really think so. Um, it's more of, it's just part of the process and that thing that you have to learn and a box you have to check to yeah. play the game. Yeah, it's an entry fee. There you go. It's a ticket. There you go. Yeah. yeah. 
do you, if you're going to reach out to, let's say, a new company that you don't have a relationship with, mm -hmm. how would you do it? Would you go through LinkedIn? Would you wait to go to a trade show? Or would you just pick up the phone and call their 800 number? Um, LinkedIn would be good. I like, I mean, you've always kind of taught, and I still totally agree. You try and find the marketing lead. You want to try to find a person that likes to sell stuff. Because his job is to, he's got a meeting coming up with Walmart, Target, whatever, in January. And he's like, me, me, me. what am I going to present? What's the new and coolest thing? So, of course, he wants to know what the new and coolest thing is. And hopefully, you've got it. So, he's motivated to listen to you. Um, sometimes the guys in the, you know, the R&D you know, department or you know, the new product department, yes, they're good. They know what they're doing. And they're you know, some incredibly talented people. But they're so busy cranking on their own projects that they've got tasked to deliver by a certain date on a certain time. And you know, they got all the numbers running around their head. Um, they won't have the bandwidth most of the times to, under, to take your call and or to listen to what you have to say. Um, so, um, yeah, trying to find the marketing lead and or somebody who's receptive to new ideas, I think is really, and that comes from all different levels of a company, but it's really more the personality type. Um, you're looking for another person like you, you're looking for a popcorn head. So if you can find another popcorn head and you'll look out, you know, you'll figure out who those are. Um, that's who you try to want to want to talk to because, um, to get a license signed, you have to look at it from the corporation's perspective and what they do in a larger corporate environment. They sit down at their boardroom, in theory, or on the internet or whatever, and you have to have somebody in the room who's going to sell your product for you when you're not there. And you have to give them the tools to do that. So that's, um, that's I guess, one of the components on the keys to, I guess, what I've done is I give them, I give my contact and the person pitching my idea in-house um, the tools that he needs to be successful in selling my product at the board level. I love it. Uh, I mean, that, that's, I mean, and I'll do detailed schedules. I mean, I'll do pricing schedules. I'll do cost modeling. I'll do, you know, entire Gantt charts, uh, wireframes. I mean, stuff, stuff that they don't even do they're like, oh my God, where did you know, this guy come from? You know, with the F? Sorry. I mean, but yeah, that's that bring them stuff that's impressive to show to Orby. I, I want to step back for just a minute and explain to everybody when you're first starting out, you're at this one level, right? Keith is at another level. Okay. So just so we understand that for a minute. And that other level that he's talking about is building good relationships with companies, they become clients. Uh, having a good working relationship, seeing what they want, but also the value add. That value add, when you're working with the company, that could be manufacturing knowledge, material knowledge, supply chain knowledge, helping that person do their job and be an asset. That's what that next level of being a, a, a professional inventor. Is that correct, Keith, from that assumption? It's just like when you take your car to get service and you pick it up, and it's done, it's going to have ass. Sorry, I'm sort of there. It's not done right. The tires aren't inflated. The car's on the like, oh, am I taking it back here? They charge you too much. Eh, I don't think so. But if you pick up your car and the guy's like, you know what? I have an extra 10 minutes. I went ahead and changed the filter for you. I'm not charging for you need for it. And I went ahead and vacuumed out your car. I just took it down to the car wash for you. Now it's nice and clean. That is the mechanic you want to go to and you will go there for the next five or six years, you know, forever. That's the type of person you want to be as a licensee. You want to, you know, they want, they want to, when you do a deal with them, they're like, oh my gosh, that was such a good experience. And I got X, Y, and Z that I wasn't expecting. It's under promise and over deliver is what I like to do. Um, because then I don't, if I'm over delivering to somebody, then I, I don't, it's not that I, then I feel that I've got enough work to give them a call again. You know, I, I want my I want my clients to feel comfortable and that I bring something of value to them. And if they're calling back and saying, "Hey, we like that last project. You really over delivered on that. Can you do it again?" I'm like, "Yeah, let's let's do it again." What would you tell yourself if you're just starting out? Hmm. Uh, get on a fishing boat in Tahiti and just go. <laughs> get out of here. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> what would I tell myself uh, if I was just starting? It's a totally, uh, I don't say a totally new 
way, but the ability now to get prototypes done, to get prototypes printed, to hire people on, you know, in I'm working with a with a gentleman in Morocco right now. He is one of the best designers I've ever contracted with, and he's doing amazing stuff. Um, also, ironically, I'm working with uh, a 3D CAD group in in Kiev, in Ukraine. In the last place you think you'd find somebody, and these guys are amazing. Um, you can find people out there if you look who are incredibly talented, who are very reasonably priced, where you can get scopes of work done that you couldn't even understand that you personally could get done. And you just put it out there on the internet and somebody will come to your aid and you're like, that's what this is. And they'll go and they'll do it. And then you can then take that 3D prototype and print it out on any of the print farms and get your part back where it's ready to go. So, um, I would tell myself, reach out to uh, service providers, if you want to call them that, or consultants or contractors that you can hire on the internet that live anywhere on the planet, you know, um, that you can use and leverage to make your product look amazing and deliver and provide those deliverables that are, um, you know, amazing to do. Um, I would have done that a lot earlier. I want to say, I would subcontract out a lot of the work I was trying to do myself. So instead of like, you know, gluing stuff together and trying to figure out how to, you know, make Bondo, you know, work with a, you know, a new Nerf gun, you know, prototype thing, I should have just, you know, well, they didn't have the internet back then really the way they did, but you know, I would have subbed up some of that stuff out before to somebody who really knew how to do, okay, what's the gearing ratio? You know, of uh, you know, spinning gear that you want at a certain RPM. You know, those those type of things. I would have, uh, you know, worked with other people. I would have, I would have brought other people into the fold quicker. I, I got a question yeah. for you, Keith. It's a very broad question, but I think it's an important question. Why do you like licensing? What do you like about it? And then also, what don't you like about it? Let's be honest. It's not all. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, what I like about it is. Um, and I, you know, Steve can know this. I, I really enjoy, you know, working on my own. You know, I, I just, I, I really like it. Um, I like to do uh, and have the freedom to kind of uh, think and do things the way that I kind of, you know, invent and just kind of run my life. Quite frankly, that being said, I put way more hours than I do in now than any other job I used to do. So it's kind of like eh, whatever. But um, what do I like about licensing? Um, every day is different. You know, because there's so many projects and there's so many different things you can be doing. Uh, every day is kind of, quite frankly, kind of new and exciting, um, which is super fun. How about finances? Um, like, do you do you like that the finances is on them, not on you? Do you do you not like that you lose some control? They decide to make it a different color, a slightly different design. What are the positive yeah. negatives in other areas? Yeah. So I mean, some of the other kind of positives are yeah, right. So. You know, taking a product, we're going to back up. Since I have such a volume of products and concepts that I want to, quite frankly, get out there and, and make, um, the the company, I, I just don't, to form a company that, to do that, I don't think I could, I don't think you could do that. I just don't think it could happen. Um, so I like it because I get to do what I, I get to do what I am really good at. That's the front end inception to first product article at the factory. That's my kind of sweet spot. Um, so that's why licensing works really well. You know, going past that, you know, financing, banking, you know, first round, a, <laughs> series A, series B, and, you know, investors and boards and insurance forms and drivers like, oh, bleh. you know, I don't like doing that stuff. <laughs> I don't know who does, but that's just not like, that's just not what I'm really good at. Um, as far as uh, what I don't like about it, um, yeah, I, it would be, I guess, you know, losing control and you know maybe when a licensee doesn't love the project or the or doesn't understand it as 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 much as I do because these are quite frankly I'm you know these oh little kids they're out there in the world and you know take care of them you know it's like well you know you, you send your kid over to somebody's house and he gets beat up and he comes back it's like dude you know you can't come over to play anymore come out of your place I mean this is a long this is a project a while ago. Um, I don't bring that one up. Yeah, it's it's yellow and it's been so long. So this one was a super quick example. This is over at Swimways. This is over at uh, 
Um, what I'm talking, the, the packaging's yellowed, it's so old. But, you know, put this together, it's uh, basically a concussion uh, rocket, it goes in the pool. You put a foam uh, rocket in a tip and you kind of slam it and it can, compresses the water. There's an interior kind of baffling system that shoots it up in the air. It goes like 30 feet in the air. It's hilarious, it's super fun. You know, all the kids I was prototyping with it, they loved it, you know, go over the roof and stuff. But um, the licensee basically didn't make the foam darts the right diameter of the stem. So they put the foam dart on there and it wouldn't launch. It wouldn't launch at all. So, I, you know, things were, and they didn't want to fix it. And so it got into Toys R Us and it lasted a season. And, you know, that was that. And so that was there, two, maybe three years of work that just went poof. So, um, and for whatever reason, they didn't want to fix the diameter of, uh, you know, of that particular product. So it's literally just been collecting dust for <laughs> 10 years. So I would say that that is um, unfortunate. You know, it, it happens. It's happened on one, more than one product where the licensee um, just doesn't go forward with the project in the way that you would hope they would have. Hey, so, Andrew, we're coming up to the end. What I'd like to do is if if everybody would put their thank yous in the column or in the chat box, we'd really appreciate it. Keith, we really want to thank you for spending time with us. Yeah, I hope I answered all the questions. I hope I didn't ramble too much. I don't even know what I said, but uh, cool. <laughs> well, you, I've known you for for quite a few years now, and you're a very giving individual. So thank you so much for doing for doing this for us. I want to make yeah. sure to get a group shot, Stephen. So can we do that? Yeah, right? now we we need to get one for the photo album, and we had a great yeah. group today. In fact. I have to say, this is probably one of the biggest crowds we've had in a while. So Keith, thank you for bringing everybody together today from all over the world, actually. So thank you very much for doing that. So here's how we're going to do the group shot. You can, your pick, you can wave your hand or give a thumbs up, one of those two. Just keep doing that for about 10, 15 seconds. I'm going to each screen. Okay, here we go. Let's get started. And then Forever. each screen, it's not going to be that long. There we go. Do another one. Another one. Okay, we're good. I got it. Thank you, guys. Hey, one last thing, Keith. Yes. How important is it to go to your local inventors group? Because we're here, Andrew and I have been supporting the inventing community for many, many years. That's how I met Andrew. And that's how we've kind of connected to at times with, with the local San Diego inventors group. Isn't that correct? Yeah, yeah. I, you have to network. Uh, no, no question, you know, network and find like individuals like yourself and they'll give you kind of tips and you can just chew on the fat with them. I mean, the, the, the challenge, you know, being a single inventor is you just don't have a water cooler where, you know, or a coffee pot with other inventors like, hey, Bill, what are you working on today? Oh, well, I'm doing this. You know, you don't have that, you know, you don't have that type of interaction and that's where networking happens. And then, and then you find out that, okay, I can do this, you know, if, if, not if that guy's doing, I can do better type of thing, but like there's other people out there um, having as much fun as I am having that um, we can all, you know, kind of, you know, the boats ride with a high tide. You know, that's what you need to get out and, and uh, get some support of what you're doing. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. Well, Andrew, you want to wrap it up? Yeah, I mean, I, Keith, you're a pro. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing with your fellow inventors your, your life experience. Um, I think they all realize it's more about just than the product, but the organization and the drive. But if you, you truly enjoy it, which you do, you do some stuff you don't enjoy, but you definitely don't need to do as much stuff as if you sold it yourself. So that's why you like the licensing business model. And just right. thank you for just being really straight with it and telling your story and inspiring everybody. I, I don't know if somebody is not walking away inspired from listening to you. I don't know. Something's wrong with that many products licensed. I don't know if some of you showed up late, licensed a lot of products, really dedicated. I don't have anything else to say, Stephen, besides that. It's amazing. Yeah, I just want to thank everybody for coming today. I see a lot of friends today from all over the world. And keep on inventing. That's what Andrew always says. Um, learn as much as you can. Keep, keep educating yourself. Please tell anybody about IGA. We do this once a month. And I just want to tell everybody, have a, a great week. And thank you, Keith and Andrew. And if you, if thank you, you, really you appreciate can, it. sorry, Keith, thank go you. ahead. Oh, I just want to thank everybody for showing up. And I hope that, 
um, you found uh, the time valuable. Thank you so much. You can you can check out the replay uh, tomorrow or the next day on our YouTube channel too if you join late. So don't worry about that. See you guys. Bye. Thank you everybody.